Imagine you start to feel sick. Maybe you're a bit thirsty, more than usual, very fatigued, using the bathroom a lot more than usual. Perhaps you start getting blurry vision. You suspect it might be diabetes, so you make an appointment with your doctor in hopes of getting a diagnosis and some treatment. Now, imagine at this appointment, the very best your doctor could do is ask you some questions about your symptoms. No blood tests, no panels, and then offer you an opinion on your diagnosis. Well, it may be diabetes. And then prescribe you an agent that wouldn't work for the majority of patients who take it at a dose that you'd likely have to adjust through trial and error and repeated visits. And this particular agent will likely make you feel a lot worse for several weeks before it starts to make you feel better. Sounds pretty unbelievable, right? In this day and age of technological advancement, you don't want your diabetes to be somebody's opinion. You want a definitive diagnosis based on a blood test and the measurement of some chemicals in that blood, and then a treatment strategy that's aimed to normalize the, the levels of those chemicals and make you feel better. Unfortunately, as unreal and outdated as that sounds, if you were to make an appointment to have a mental illness diagnosed, that's precisely what would happen. Mental illnesses are in many ways much more devastating than bodily illnesses. Eight million people die a year from mental illnesses. The W Health Organization has stated that mental illnesses such as depression are the leading cause of disability worldwide and pose the largest economic burden. One in five Americans is prescribed antidepressants. Let's think about that for a second. That's a phenomenal number of people. That's a huge amount of people. And antidepressants don't work for the majority of patients who take them. And for reasons that I'm going to get to a little bit later, um, I'll outline the fact that the research community has lost interest in recent years in developing better and more improved antidepressant therapies. Mental illnesses, unlike bodily illnesses, are fraught with shame and taboos and stigma. So what's the difference between mental illnesses and diseases of the body? What's the difference between, say, diabetes and depression? Well, the primary difference is that we understand diseases of the body much, much better than we understand diseases of the brain. Let's talk about diabetes. We know the chemicals that will mark diabetes. Amongst others, these are things like glucose and insulin. We may take a blood sample, we can measure glucose and insulin, and because we know what's wrong, we can make a diagnosis based on those chemicals, and we can develop drugs to target glucose and insulin and get them back to normal and make you feel better. Unfortunately, that's not the case for, for psychiatric diseases. Why is that? There's a strict separation between the body and the brain. It's called the blood-brain barrier. It exists for a really good reason. It exists to strictly control the inflow and outflow of chemicals out of our brains into our brains, protects us from things, um, say, like um, bacteria and viruses. But what it means is that if we take blood, the levels of chemicals in our blood do not reflect the levels of chemicals in our brain. So to ask questions of the brain, then you would think perhaps we should take a sample of the brain. While taking a blood sample, no one likes to do it, but it's a relatively simple and non-disturbing thing. We can't really think about opening up someone's skull and taking a sample. This is potentially devastating. We can't do that. Plus, if you think about it, the, the, the chemicals that we would be looking for that would likely mark an illness, these are chemicals I'm going to call neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are chemical transmitters that take messages from one brain cell to another from one neuron to another. They do this through the tiniest of junctions. That, that junction is called a synapse. It's so small, it's about a thousandth of a human hair, the thousandth of diameter of a human hair. And they do it real dynamically, very, very fast. They move from one cell to another within a second. So taking a sample likely wouldn't tell us very much about the functionality of the system. To do that, we want to look in on it while it's working without disturbing it. How do we do it? Well, over the past decade or so, my research program has been to take a technical approach to this problem. We've developed ultra, ultra tiny probes made out of carbon. They're not a thousandth of a human hair, perhaps they're a hundredth of a human hair, but they're so small that we can directly implant them into tissue and measure these neurotransmitters as they go about their business without disturbing the system. So that's exciting. We have some technology now that we can use to perhaps ask some questions of the brain. 
So when it comes to psychiatric diseases, where do we start? Let's, let's focus on depression. What should we measure? Well, back in the late 70s, there was something called the monoamine hypothesis of depression, and here's how it went. The idea was that people that were experiencing depression, the levels of certain of these neurotransmitters, in particular a neurotransmitter called serotonin, are lower between the cells than someone who is not experiencing depression. Now, mind you, this was a hypothesis with no real way to test it because the technology wasn't available. But the hypothesis precipitated the development of the modern-day antidepressants that we know as SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. The idea is that these drugs will block a key protein that's tasked with um, clearing serotonin from, from the extracellular space. And the idea is that the serotonin levels will go up and um, alleviate depression symptoms. The theory precipitated the development. The first of the type of the first of their type of these agents was Prozac, and since the late 70s, the agents haven't changed very much. Like I said, they don't work for the majority of patients who take them. About 70% of patients do not experience clinical relief, and they have a lot of unwanted side effects. So there are issues here. The hypothesis has been around. There's been no real way to test it. So to, to now, we still don't know whether serotonin is different during depression or not. No one really knows how these SSRIs work. So the fact that we don't know what's wrong in the first place, we don't know how to fix it, means that we don't know how to develop better agents. And that's why steadily over the past few decades, the research community has just lost interest in bettering and optimizing these agents. Okay. So we said, let's start there. Let's go and optimize our probes to be able to measure serotonin. And let's just ask, is serotonin different during depression or not? So we did this. It took us a long time. But we made these measurements in rodent models. We asked, is serotonin different in a depressed model versus a non-depressed model? And we found that it was, actually. We were surprised. We found very robustly in models of depression that the serotonin levels were lower. So we have, for the first time in decades, proved this hypothesis. Still doesn't tell us why the SSRIs are not effective clinically, because, like I said, they're tasked with increasing the serotonin levels. So the next experiment that we did was to administer the SSRI during depression and during um, the control um, situation. In the control situation, where there's no depression, the SSRIs very quickly and rapidly increase the serotonin levels. So far, so good. We would expect that. But this was not the case during depression. During depression, the SSRIs were much, much less effective at increasing the serotonin levels. That's interesting. So we asked why. During depression, serotonin levels are low, and the SSRIs are much, much less effective at increasing the serotonin levels. So I want you to follow me on a train of thought here. There's a big um, trend in psychiatric disease research, and this is a trend that involves a phenomenon called neuroinflammation. Neuroinflammation is a general term that is used to describe um, our brain's immune reaction to something, whether it's a pathogen or it's um, a chronic disease. And actually, it's a little more profound than that. Neuroinflammation occurs when there is a bodily inflammation. So if our bodies are fighting something, our brains are fighting something too. So our body's immune reactions are linked to our brain's immune reactions. In recent years, researchers have found a very close link between neuroinflammation and psychiatric disorders, in particular depression. There's no depression without neuroinflammation. There's no neuroinflammation without depression. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg story. I thought, what is neuroinflammation doing to these neurotransmitters in our brain? And nobody knows very much about that. We do know something about bodily inflammation. When the body's fighting something, there are higher levels of a molecule called histamine in our bodies. Histamine, if you have allergies or if you're fighting something, you're sick, the levels of histamine are higher. This was interesting to me because for a long time people have thought that histamine in the brain drives down serotonin levels. So I wanted to know, during neuroinflammation, are the levels of histamine in the brain higher? So we went back to the drawing board and we engineered our probes to be able to simultaneously measure serotonin and histamine. We did this, and it turns out very robustly, during all of the depression models that we've looked at, there's more histamine in the brain, and as a consequence, there's less serotonin. 
All right. So we know serotonin levels are lower during inflammation and depression. We know that that's because the histamine levels are higher, but we still don't know why these SSRIs are not very effective. It turns out when they were developing the SSRIs, they didn't know much about histamine. No one was thinking about histamine. So they made them selective um, with regards to the things that we knew about, things like dopamine and norepinephrine, say. But because we weren't thinking about histamine, we didn't care to look at their effects on histamine. So this is what we did. We looked at what these agents are doing to the brain histamine. And guess what? All of them are also increasing the histamine levels in the brain. All right, so let me put this together for you. The issue at hand is that serotonin is low, lower during depression. One of the primary reasons is that histamine is higher because our brains are undergoing neuroinflammation. So we have a seesaw scenario here. Our primary bid to increase the levels of serotonin with the SSRIs is also increasing the levels of histamine, which is driving the serotonin levels back down. So you get no net effect. And all of this is dependent on our immune systems. Mine's different from yours, it's different from yours. So this speaks volumes to me in terms of the huge clinical variability in the response, because all of our immune systems are different. All right, so this is really exciting. We have, for the first time, I believe, figured out chemical markers of depression, histamine and serotonin. And how can we now think about a treatment strategy? Okay? We started to think of agents that would mitigate the effects of histamine on serotonin. I know what you're thinking. Some of you are thinking antihistamines, correct? Unfortunately, that won't work for us because antihistamines are designed to mitigate histamine's effects on histamine. So we needed to find an agent um, that would help us with a scenario, and we did. We found an agent that was able to globally lower the uh, levels of histamine during inflammation. When we co-administered that agent with the SSRI during depression, we were able to get the serotonin levels right back up to the control values, and this was associated with a, a diminishment in the depression symptoms. So this is really exciting. We've got the means for a diagnosis, we've got the means for a treatment. But the experiments that I've described to you happen in well-controlled rodent models in our lab. What does it mean for you? What does it mean for you when you make that appointment to get a diagnosis? I still can't open up your brain and put a probe in there. So. Here's what I'm thinking. Let me introduce you at this point to my best friend. Who's my best friend? This is Ginger. Ginger helped me with this. Ginger is the best dog in the world. Best dog in the world. Anybody that's ever met Ginger will agree. Best dog, hands down. Um, I'm not the only one that says that about my dog. If you have a dog, you probably think the same about your dog. We as humans have a very special relationship with our dogs for a variety of reasons. Dogs are fascinating. For me, what's really fascinating about a dog is the dog's sense of smell. I'm a sensor person. There's no more exquisite sensor than that dog's olfactory system. Other animals have exquisite olfactory systems, but what makes dogs so special is that they're smart enough to be able to attribute sense to our moods. When I'm sad, Ginger will come sit with me. And the smartest of dogs can be trained to actually sniff out specific markers of our moods and correlate them, say, to PTSD or anxiety attacks. And this saves lives. They're smelling our moods. They're smelling something outside of the brain that's telling them how we feel. Unfortunately, Ginger can't tell me what that is. But I thought about this for many years. What can we use outside of our body to give us an indication of what's happening in our brains? I tried a bunch of different things. And I'm really excited to focus in on this idea of stem cells. Stem cells are cells that we can take from our body. You can take them from the skin. They contain all of the genetic information that if exposed to the right combination of chemicals and growth factors, they can be turned into any type of cells in our bodies. We have colleagues that have figured out how to take human stem cells, skin cells, and turn them into serotonin neurons. So we did this. We grew serotonin neurons in a Petri dish. And my question was, if I put my probe in there, can I measure serotonin in the same way that I measure in the brain? And the answer is yes. These cells release serotonin, they reuptake it, very much like the diagram that I showed you. So my next question is, are these cells now reflecting what's going on in the brain? So we're doing a large-scale study where we're comparing depressed versus non-depressed. 
And so far, so good. It looks like all avenues are pointing to yes. So this is really exciting to us now. Because for the first time, we have this idea of taking something peripheral outside of the brain to give us information about the brain. No need to open up your brain and put a probe in there. All you have to do is take a skin swab. We could grow those cells, turn them into serotonin neurons, make the chemical measurement, make a diagnosis. Depending on the levels of serotonin and histamine, we could come up with a personalized therapy strategy for you. And that would be different than it would be for you, and that would be different than it would be for you. Can you imagine now making that appointment, going to the doctor? The ultimate goal would be to have some sort of microchip that the doctors and the practitioners could use in-house to grow your cells and maybe get an answer within hours or days. And that's a definitive diagnosis. That takes the opinions out of that diagnosis. Much more streamlining the treatment strategies. Taking the opinions out of diagnosis will take out the taboos and the stigma. That's a definitive diagnosis. Having a definitive treatment strategy will allow us to treat psychiatric diseases with the same clinical precision that we treat bodily diseases, allowing us to take an unshameful view towards depression as we do say to diabetes. Thank you.